back to our evening service this evening and uh, trust the Lord will bless us again this evening. Good to have David back with us again this evening and his wife joining us as well. And uh, pray that the Lord will bless us as we gather together and sing his praise and listen to his word. We're going to stand and sing a hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, King of Creation. Let's stand with the music. Let's just commit the meeting to the Lord in prayer. And just as we do so, just to be update on uh, Terry's dad. He's still having some tests done, and they're waiting for the results of those tests before they can decide what the next stage of treatment will be. And a bit of good news with regard to Rosemary condition. There is some improvement in her situation. She's responding to the treatment, and the doctors are well pleased. Now, Ken has said that there's still very limited visitation of family only and uh, he will update me so as I can update you so as you don't have to keep continually ringing Ken because he's quite stressed and quite uh, tearful at the minute just about the situation so I will pass on any information with regard to Rosemary's condition in due course so let's just come and pray and give thanks to God for that Father, we come into your presence again this evening and we thank you that we can come right into the very presence of God, Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We acknowledge our unworthiness to come in our own strength or our own merits. But Lord, we just come again this evening with thankful hearts. 
you've blessed us today already and we just thank you for the blessings lavished upon us for health and strength and we just thank you Lord that you've given us health and strength to be able to be out again this evening but we think of those Lord who are less fortunate than ourselves and the health issues we just give you thanks Lord for the improvement in Rosemary's condition and the answers to prayer that that has been pray you continue your hand upon her and be with the medical staff as they assess her condition be with Ken, Lord, to just sustain and strengthen him at this time. And we just pray to you for Terry's dad that these tests may, tr- may be positive and that he won't need any further surgery or any procedures, but he may be able to get home very soon again. Just be with them and pray for the family at this time that you will alleviate their stress and help them to keep trusting and looking to you. But for this service this evening, Lord, you know all about our individual needs. And we pray that as your word is opened and expounded to us this evening, that you would meet each of our needs as you see fit. And let me just pray for David as he would open your word, that he might do the help again of your Holy Spirit, and that he might be uplifted and strengthened by him as he unfolds that what you've shown him in the secret place to share with us this evening. Give us ears to hear and hearts and minds to respond in a positive way, and that your word might indeed uh, be applied into our lives, that we might live lives that will reflect the beauty of Christ as we were hearing about this morning, that our lives might tell for you in this community, because we pray in Jesus' name, giving you thanks. Amen. Just before we sing our next hymn, reminder of Tuesday night, our midweek, and uh, it be good to see you all back again next Tuesday night. And next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, so if you can be in your seats by 11, so as we can observe our minute silence at 11 o'clock and these are all the announcements and the subject to the will of the Lord now we're going to sing another hymn shout to the Lord and uh, let's stand when you get the music and sing this
before David comes and speaks, if we're going to sing again, we keep our seats this time. Lord, I lift your name on high. Good evening. It's great to be to be back with you tonight, and uh, we're going to look at Colossians, Colossians chapter four. Paul's letter, Colossians chapter four, and I'm going to read from verse two to eighteen. Colossians 4, verse 2 to 18. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Tychius will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent them to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, Concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. 
Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that ye may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you, and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this letter. We give you thanks for Paul and how you bless them. And Father, as we delve into your word, and as we delve into his letter to the Colossians, we pray that we may glean wisdom from it. Heavenly Father, that we would understand how you want to challenge us and encourage us and speak to us individually and collectively. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody here speak Hungarian? No, apart from the lovely lady at the front there. Well, I'm going to teach you some Hungarian. So one of my favorite dishes in our home is what is known as rantis hushi. And basically it's translated, it means fried meat. So you've heard of KFC. Well, KFC in our house is Kelly Fried Chicken. And my wife's chicken's the only chicken I eat. Apart from a mother-in-law's, because you can't say no to your mother-in-law, so you can't. And I don't eat chicken in restaurants because of an incident that happened to me about 10 years ago when I got a takeaway and I had food poisoning for two weeks. You're probably wondering, what on earth has that got to do with tonight's message? Well, you see, just like the rantus hushi, in life you need to have the right recipe for living. And it needs to be followed properly. So in the end you leave the right legacy, a lovely, lasting legacy. And you see, the church here at Colossae, they were in danger of being poisoned. They were in danger of their church community breaking up because of man-made philosophies, of which there were numerous in these times, in these Greco-Roman times. And so Paul has to write to them. He has to try and do something about it. He has to address it. And so in this passage, Paul points out two key ingredients. Not them all, but two key ingredients for the recipe for living the way Christ wants every Christian to live. And then from verse 10 onwards, we have this snappy insight into the legacy of the people around Paul and how they will be remembered within the Christian community. So right away in the first verse that we read, we have a key ingredient. No surprise. Prayer. And yet it's one if we're honest, it can be squeezed out of life. It can be ignored at times. It can be forgotten. And maybe at times it can be done in a weak manner without maybe the passion and the zest that we should have when we know we're interacting with Almighty God. So verse 2 says, Continually, continue steadfastly in prayer. Or the NIV says, devote yourselves to prayer. 
being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So whether it's continue or devote, the original Greek word used here denotes this great sense of persistence, a sense of determination, a relentless desire to pray. And it's a sense that Paul is writing that it's spontaneous, that it's personal devotion, that it's passionate. And that was going to be very different from the prayers within Judaism, which were a bit more, if you like, structured, structured prayer times. But here was this man, Paul, immersed in the Jewish faith, declaring Christ Messiah. And he's saying, this is how we've got to pray as Jewish Christians, people of the way, as they were known then. So you see the first challenge, the first ingredient for living for Christ. It's right there. It's right up there with, with reading of our Bibles, isn't, there, isn't it? They're the two great pillars that we have. You get those wrong, and the result is not going to be the way God wants us to live our lives. So the challenge, the first challenge, the first ingredient is this persistence, this determination, this devotion to prayer. And I, I'm not here to put anybody in a guilt trip. I challenge myself, but and we all know where we're at with prayer. I wonder what is the depth, what is the sense of passionate power and real belief that we come to God in prayer. Believing he's going to change things. Believing maybe he's going to bring revival. And I know I've gone through periods of neglecting prayer and the busyness of life and it gets squeezed out. And maybe that's why Paul uses these words. He uses that Greek word to emphasize you need determination here. You need that passion. You need that persistence. Because when you don't have that daily passionate prayer time, you're open to temptations. You're open to other influences. And, and the reality is that there's a vacuum appears and it will be filled by other influences. Just as it was going to happen here in this church with different philosophies and ideas that could easily twist the minds of those seeking to build a church community. It doesn't take much for a little poison to get into a church community and wreck it. To bring division, to bring strife, numbers dwindle, Egos get in the way. Everything crumbles. Why? Because man pushes out God and brings his own ego in. And, and, and we, see, we see that across our own, our own country, don't we? So note when Paul talks about prayer life, he says, be watchful and do it with thanksgiving. There's a sense of being alert being aware of the needs around you, the issues that need God's intervention. They needed it here in Colossae. They needed to be aware of those who were going to try and spoil their church community with false ideas. This key ingredient for a thriving church. So, so important. And so important when we engage in prayer. We are fully aware that we're in a spiritual battle. Sometimes it can even be a battle to get down and do serious prayer. That's, that's the reality of it. Particularly in this mad, busy world that we now all live in. And when you pray, he says to the Colossians, he's writing to them, be thankful. Be thankful because of what Christ did for you. 
Because if you're thankful, think about it, if you're thankful and you appreciate deep down what someone has done for you, you're less likely to listen to rumor, to listen to the backstabbing. You're less likely to listen to those who would seek to poison you against somebody else, maybe a fellow believer. So Paul's writing to him and he's saying, you Colossians, you know what Christ has done for you. Be thankful you don't need any, anybody else to, to come in and add on ideas to the message of Christ. This world, it tells us that we, we need to believe this way or we need to believe that to have a rounded, a rounded life. It, it tells us to accept something as good when we know it is sinful. It tells us that we need all these material things to really make us happy, to, to add on to what Christ has given us. And we know it's, it's a lie and we have to be watchful. We have to guard against it, writes Paul. And if these Colossians had to be reminded, if they needed this rocket to be reminded that they had to be devoted to prayer, then, then so do we. Verse 3 to 4. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So continuing with the ingredient of prayer, Paul wants these Colossians to not just focus on their own lives, but to pray for him. So here's this guy in prison, Paul, and he wants an opportunity to speak for Christ. And it isn't like today's prisons. He's chained up in a dungeon. It's dark. He only gets to interact with the prison officer. And the reason he's here is because he won't bow the knee to the philosophies of that day to the Roman Empire's beliefs. And he wants to be a witness in the prison. Not just a witness in the prison. He wants to get these letters out to be a witness to the world. The mystery of Christ. How the Jewish boy was Messiah and opened up God to everyone, Jew and Gentile. We, we tend to view, and rightly so, we view Paul as a great, great man of God, incredibly used by God. And yet, there's so much greatness, if you like, within him in his humility. He says, pray for me. Pray for me that I'll get it right. Pray for me that I'll speak clearly. He needs the door open for the message. He's like you and me. He needs help to be able to speak clearly. And here we are in 2022 reading his letter. He was praying that he could get the message out. And 2,000 years later, we're reading all about it. He wanted doors to be open. And wow, were those doors open over centuries. So that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient mentioned is wisdom, verse 5 to 6. The NIV says, conduct yourselves wisely. The ESV says, states, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul, as he, as he writes this letter, he shifts from asking prayers for himself and then moves back to those believers at Colossae who are looking to, to build up the church community. And if they're going to do it, then there has to be a certain amount of self-examination. How they act. How they spend their time. How they speak. And just as these Christians were being challenged here in this part of the letter by Paul, well, surely we are challenged too. 
How do those outside the church community, how do they around Cumber or wherever it may be, how do they view you? What do they see in this church? What do you offer them? And we can think of ourselves as individuals as well. Do we act wisely? Do our actions reflect Christ? Or do they just reflect the way those who don't know Christ as Saviour act? Or is there really something different? Don't waste your time, says Paul. Make the best use of it. I know I've wasted too much time, if I'm being honest. Too much time on the cares of this world. Things that can be a distraction, even things that are good things, if you like. Family life, hobbies, maybe enjoying sport, leisure time, going out. Not bad things in themselves, but then on reflection, maybe used as distractions to waste time. Time that could have been used more wisely. Just a few sentences before in this, in in what we call chapter 3, verse 2, but remember it's a letter he's writing. And just a few sentences before, he says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind. I, I find that very challenging because there's so many distractions I find where it's social media or the news, whatever it may be. Set your mind on things that are above. And again, if he has to write to the early church and say this, you know, it's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it, that 2,000 years later, it's the same thing (laughs) applies. Set your mind on things that are above. And then he feels he must, he must write to them. And it's interesting, he felt this, and we wonder, why, why did he feel he had to write this? But he feels he has to write to them about their speech. Always be gracious, and your speech has to be seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer people, so you may know how to interact with people in the right way. So here's a recipe within a recipe, if you like. The recipe for speaking to people. And and not just about Jesus, but all the time. With grace. And not just grace, but it should be seasoned with salt. So what does salt do in those days? Of course, like today, it adds taste. We all like salt in our fish and chips. But of course, back then, it was used to preserve, to protect from the meat being corrupted. So you can see the picture he's painting about speech. Painting a picture of how we should act and speak. So is our conversation always filled with grace? Is it seasoned with salt? I would have to confess at times that my speech at times is probably seasoned with Tabasco sauce or maybe curry powder. My daughter played tennis locally many years ago uh, when she was younger and she was often treated very badly for some reason. And I have to admit, it brought out the worst in me. Made me angry. And at times it spoke too sharply. And some people could say, yeah, but you had a right to be angry because it's your family. And Yeah, but Paul says, always. Your speech always seasoned with salt. We're to speak with grace seasoned with salt. We need help with that, don't we? We need to ask, why does our speech sometimes have, why is it sometimes seasoned with battery acid rather than salt? Is it frustration? 
Is it anger? Is it a sense of injustice? Is it hurt? And then that leads on, I feel, to the challenge of where's your faith rooted? Is it in man? Is it in your ego? Or is it in God? Is it in Christ? Is that trust there when we're insulted? When we're betrayed? When we're let down? Is that trust so deep? that our words are always seasoned with salt. Is that easy? No. <laughs> no. And that's why we that's why we have to be so passionate in our prayer life. So I wonder how your speech is. Is it seasoned with salt? Does it suggest to people that you're a follower of Christ? Does it suggest you have a different worldview? You know, as you deal with that young person who's a pain in the backside, or you deal with, you know, the person in the the BT call center, you've been hanging on for 45 minutes, the music's driving you mad. Is it seasoned with salt? Paul's writing to Christians here, remember. And he's essentially saying that, you know, if you're sincere believers, You've got to be sincere about how you're presenting Christ. Your speech, your actions, pointing people to Christ or deflecting people from Christ. Do we show our own personal ego or do we really show Christ? The grace spoken of here is a Greek word which you may have heard before called charis. And the Greek dictionary that I looked at says it is the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection on life. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection on life. And when I read that, I went, wow. So our speech, our conversation must demonstrate charis, The influence of the divine. Do we show the influence of the divine? I find that a massive challenge. And I have to be honest, I wondered, do church communities in Northern Ireland take that seriously? Really seriously? Because sometimes... I hear phrases, I don't know if you do or not, but I hear phrases like, oh, he gives it to you straight, which is code for he's rude. Or she's a bit of a grumpy old woman, but like she comes out every Sunday. Right. The influence of the divine. Often these issues, they go back to the cornerstones of our faith don't they They go back to prayer and bible study Um, they go back to how we respect the cross how we respect christ what he has done for us and that ultimate sign of grace which is the cross what what does that really mean for us is it reflected in how we speak to others do people see a divine influence And I wonder, what what would it be like in our communities if there were such a massive sense of a divine influence in every believer? What would that do? How would people react to that? How could they deny it? How could they deny the reality of Christ if there's a divine influence emanating from every believer? I really take encouragement from Paul because he asked for help. Pray for me that I may speak clearly. That's a big encouragement to me. He wanted wisdom. He wanted to speak clearly. He needed help. He needed them to be praying for him. And and we all need help. 
to live for Christ. We all need those prayers, those passionate prayers. So we've looked at the ingredients of prayer and wisdom. And then we have the legacy in the remaining verses. And I'm, I'm going to fly through these. So fasten your seatbelts and if you're going to read on, uh, stick with me. I'm going to go through these guys that are spoken about quite quickly and you can maybe ponder about them later. Um, the legacy that they leave. So verse 7 to 9, Tychius will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. So if you look at the legacy of Tychius and Onesimus, like these are two men, if we're honest, not a lot of people know about. You know, you ask people to name people in the Bible, characters in the Bible, they're not going to name these two guys. But who wouldn't want to have a legacy that these men left? Look how Paul describes them. Beloved brother, faithful minister. Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother. And he's described as one of you. In other words, he's going back to where he was born to work with them. These men were faithful servants. They had a sense of Christian duty and discipline. They fought the fight, as Paul would have said. What a way to be remembered. I know that it can be tough if you're a small church community and everybody would like more numbers in their church, of course. But crucially, we need to make sure that we're leaving this kind of legacy. Surely that's what we want. A legacy of faithful and service. This was the mark of these men. They were faithfully serving through all the ups and downs. And you can bet your life they made mistakes the way we make mistakes. Faithful, beloved you get the real sense of community, the sense of interaction in the community here. That was their legacy. Next, verse 10 to 11, and I'm going to group together Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice. And just note there that Paul writes, Mark, the cousin of, of Barnabas. If he comes to you, welcome him. Why does he make that statement? Why, why does he have to insert that and make sure make, make sure you welcome him? You know, wh why does he feel he needs to do that? Well, in Acts 15, uh, Paul and Barnabas have a bust up, as you probably know. Splits in the church didn't happen in the 20th century or 21st century. And there's this argument. And Paul, Paul is annoyed with Mark because he left the, the first missionary journey and you can imagine Paul felt a bit of a sense of betrayal and Paul hadn't forgotten the hurt the hurt that he felt at, at that point but at the time of this uh, the writing of this letter he's clearly truly forgiven him so make sure you welcome him he says Mark has clearly learned from his mistakes. And most importantly, Paul has forgiven him. And there's a message in there in itself, isn't there? The legacy of Mark, Aristarchus and Justice in their relationship with Paul, he says is that they have been a great comfort to me. So Mark had gone from deeply hurting Paul to being a great comfort to him. The sense of betrayal 
was not the end. It wasn't the end game of their relationship. I wonder, is there a relationship in your life? Is there a relationship in this church? Is there some relationship that you're connected to and it's time to sort it out? Maybe the person you fell out with a long time ago needs someone to comfort them. They need friendship. And real friendship means so much, doesn't it? It meant enough that Paul highlighted it in this letter. And we're reading about it 2,000 years later. So the legacy of those three men was, they were a great comfort to me. Again, who wouldn't want to have a legacy like that? That you were a great comfort to those in need. And, and I've heard today about people who have suffered bereavement and those who are ill. And I guess you guys in your community have that chance to be a great comfort to those people. Next, Epaphras, verse 12 to 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. The legacy of Epaphras is his prayers what we might call a prayer warrior. If you look at him, look how he's described here. It's a battle, like what we touched on earlier. He's struggling on your behalf. So it's not some limp prayer. It's not just a a fast one-minute prayer and get it done. It's a battle. He's struggling. He's he's concerned about them. He's deeply concerned. He's bound to know the same things that Paul knows, that there could be issues there. There could be a a split coming there if they listen to this nonsense, these nonsense philosophies. He loves you so much, people at Colossae, that he's struggling and battling in prayer for you. He's relentless in it. Why? So that you may stand firm. So that you're not wilt when the heat is on. That's the prayer life we want, isn't it? You want that kind of legacy? I know I do that kind of legacy in my prayer life. You're relentless. You're battling. You're striving. Epaphras is doing what we have regarded as the first ingredient in this part of the letter. He's devoted to prayer. So the Christians can stand firm. Those Christians need that passionate prayer to stand firm. It's not going to just happen by accident. And what do they have to stand against? Division. The man-made rules and ideas. The threat is always there. And what causes that? Well, the second ingredient we remember is wisdom. And wisdom gets corrupted by man's ego. He's praying hard they will be mature believers. The reality is you could be 90 and be spiritually immature. Standing firm. Being mature. It's, it's reflecting what Paul is, has been writing about, isn't it? Actions, speech, thinking. Set your mind on heavenly things. Watch out, be watchful in your prayer for the poisonous philosophies that can come in and cause conflict. The prayers of Epaphras were going to be crucial in them them standing firm in their beliefs. And what were their beliefs? Because there was no denominations. There were no choirs to argue about. There was no pews to argue about. There was no worship really to argue about. There were no Bible versions to argue about. So what were they going to divide over? The very essence of the gospel. 
that Christ is the way, the truth, the life, the fundamentals. We need to make sure we get the fundamentals right as believers. And Paul is making it clear here, there's no other way, there should be no diluting, there should be no adding, there should be no compromise on his teaching. We want you to be able to stand firm. Because you've got to be all in with Christ's teaching. Are we all in with his truth? Are we all in on how we should speak? How we should reflect Christ? Or do we excuse bad habits? Do we excuse the little bit of resentment? The little bit of anger? Do we excuse the little bit of bitterness? Epaphras had a great legacy, didn't he? His prayers were powerful. He was battling. Paul also says there in verse 13 about how he had concern for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. He was a grafter for the gospel, you might say. From verse 14 onwards, the names keep coming with their legacies, and you can dwell on those when you go home. Luke, Nympha, she had a church in her home. This woman provided the home for the believers to meet as a church community. What a legacy. Archibus, you've got a ministry to carry out. Get on with it. What's your ministry? What can you do? What's your legacy going to be? What's my legacy going to be? Verse 19. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Paul has left his own legacy and how God uh, used him, and we know that, how God inspired him to write these letters from prison. So circumstance didn't matter. He was all in with Christ. He writes warts and all, we might say. He knew the godly ingredients he needed in his life. He knew he couldn't live the life that he had to in his own strength. He needed help as we need help. He recognized the godly goodness in others, writes about their legacy. And their legacy is not forgotten because we've read it and we've looked at it tonight. wonder what our legacy is going to be. As I was thinking about that, I remember a lovely lady called Mary Totten in Balna Hinch, where I used to live. Just a quiet, lovely lady whose name wouldn't mean anything, I suppose, to people, only those who really knew her. And yet her legacy was immense. She faithfully went to the mission hall. She faithfully prayed. She faithfully served God. And I remember that lady because she had just such an immense legacy because she was a faithful servant. So remember the Hungarian and just like the Rantus Hushi, we need the right ingredients to live out a tasty, appealing life for Christ, to leave behind a legacy that honours the ultimate sign of grace the cross, because the cross changes everything. Amen. We're going to stand to sing our closing hymn, King of Kings, Majesty. Let's stand to sing. <laughs>
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that God, the Holy Spirit, met with us tonight. Father, we, we pray that we would genuinely seek to serve you. Father, we genuinely seek to leave a legacy that honors you. Oh, Father, each day may you challenge us in how we reflect Jesus Christ. Go with us now and may you bless this church community, Father. May you bless them in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.